Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario. A beautiful summer day here in Ottawa. Makes you want to take a tour, <laughs> yeah. a, a walking tour. And who better to talk to about walking tours? A good friend, Tony Davidson. How are you? Hi, I'm, I'm great. Good. So you, we should say off the top, you are not a historian per no, se. No. Sociologist. Yes, absolutely. So we, we, we forgive people for not being historians on the show. <laughs> Okay, thank but you. you do what are essentially historic walking tours of uh-huh. Ottawa. Uh-huh. Well, my my research is and has been for a long time on the sociology of statues. So as a sociologist, I understand statues as not these sort of things that are reflective of the past or stuck in the past, but as things that are very much of the present and as these sort of urban subjects that have vi- very dynamic social lives. Mm -hmm. So I treat them in the present, which is what sociologists do. But of course, uh, because they are, I just said they didn't represent the past, but they do (laughs) in certain ways. I mean, they they do. Yeah. So it is, it's uh, my, my tours are sociological and, and historical, but I'm really interested in how engagements with monuments have changed over time and what people do at monuments. So I'm less The history of of the subject being commemorated is always very important, uh, but I'm really interested in in monuments in the present moment and in the urban environment. Yeah, and we should I should say too that you gave one of my classes a tour in the fall Mm -hmm. on Mm -hmm. probably the worst night possible to do a walking tour. It was cold and rainy. Yeah, Yeah. uh, it was it was not ideal, but it was still a lot of fun. Yeah, and one of the things though that I found interesting in doing the tour is taking the step from these are history. They're like a statue is in a way a public history thing, but you're taking it from a sociological perspective. Mm-hmm. So how then do we manage the relationship between the past and the present when we're looking at these things? Because ultimately that that's really what you're doing. Well, one thing that, that I always sort of say about statues is that they don't have a predetermined life course. Actually, I don't always say that, but that was a nice turn of phrase. And, I should. <laughs> and, and that, uh, like, just because you've erected something in a square does not mean that it will or should stay there, right? right. Because society is dynamic. And uh, monuments are very distinct from things like books or, you know, museum artifacts in that you can't really avoid them. They're so present in our urban environment. So one thing that my research showed and that I really sort of kept saying in light of the Charlottesville protests in the United States um, is that the idea of, of taking down monuments is does not change the past, but it does reflect our relationship to the past mm. in ways that, that are very powerful. Right. So I think one thing that like monuments, should they be torn down? Absolutely. Should that. But other things that can be done with monuments are put them in the basements of museums and say, this is something we once thought was so important. It should be in a central part of our city. Now we think that this history is much more, you know, we have other things to put in the center of our city. So there are other things that can be done with complicated monuments, but also people have done things. And we see this in Ottawa of keeping monuments, but at changing the plaques, yep. offering different sort of more nuanced explanations. So for example, in Ottawa at the uh, monument to Champlain for a long time, the plaque that accompanied, accompanied it said Samuel de Champlain, the first great Canadian. Right. That plaque, Champlain's still there. That plaque's not there. Mm. And now there's a much more nuanced plaque. So there are, there are many ways that uh, our understanding of the past sort of unfolds in the present. Yeah, because that context is lacking when it's in a square, right? Mm-hmm. And I've started working with the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada over at Parks Canada. And one of the things that they do is write plaques. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting to sort of see the process that you don't have a lot of space. Mm-hmm. There's certain language that you need to use or maybe not use in some cases. It has to be translatable as well. Mm-hmm. Whether you write it in English or write it in French, the translation has to make sense. Like there's all these factors that go into a plaque that don't allow for really a full context to it. Mm-hmm. And a statue has no context. It's just a statue. Right. And one of the things that I always say to people when they 
ask me about taking statues down, because we'll get to my rather extremist position on this (laughs) in a little bit, is that if you take it, like, without context, it becomes an honorific to somebody. Mm -hmm. And maybe it shouldn't be an honorific. Mm -hmm. And I get the sense from you is that you would agree with that. And part of what you're trying to accomplish with the walking tours is that contact. Yeah, yeah. For sure. So well, I had I had um, one other thing yeah, um, to yeah. say. So I don't want to present the idea that our understanding of history is going in this sort of one direction. Also, monuments, as we also saw with Charlottesville and also with the Cornwallis statue in Halifax, they are sites where a lot of sort of nostalgia for very violent histories mm. is generated, right? So it's like these monuments are not... Or responses to them do not go in a singular direction. Right. And this is what, as a sociologist, I find so sort of fascinating is the deep ambivalence of, of monuments. So you can have at the same place um, a site that allows for all sorts of post-colonial resistance and all sorts of colonial nostalgia. And it's mm. all sort of coalescing around this, this, uh, this monument. So they really are these sort of enablers of bringing to the fore otherwise not visible social tensions. Right. And and as you say, that can change over time because I'm always struck by war memorials, like mm-hmm. the, the ones that were just sprouted up all over the country in the 1920s that for a lot of people were essentially headstones for sons who never came home. Mm-hmm. So they were like sites, very, very funerary in their mm-hmm. meaning. But now those people who use them as those sites are gone. And so the way in which those sites are now used are very different. Now it's much more commemorative, yeah, yeah. if not even celebratory, of the war and Canada's role in the war. So you, like you say, it's not a static meaning. It changes based on time and place. And I honestly wonder, because my friend Sarah Karn, who I've worked with on the Vimy Foundation, she's mentioned that there are historians who believe that the two world wars will eventually be studied as one conflict. As we get further and further right. away from yeah, it, yeah. and the time doesn't seem as, as far away, that that'll eventually happen. So what does that change then to the meaning of the monuments and all that? So it's always going to be in flux and always going mm-hmm. to be changing. But for you, giving walking tours of these sites, I, I would have to imagine that when most tourists come, they want to see what, 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 whatever it is, Sir John A., certainly the War Memorial, mm-hmm. um, Maybe the Indigenous War Memorial or whatever. It's not a memorial, whatever, right. it, whatever, whatever the word Aboriginal is. It's an Aboriginal War Veterans Memorial. Is it a memorial? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so they, they would want to see sort of those types of things and, and maybe other ones that are on the hill. But they would have an expectation of what those things are and what they mean. Mm-hmm. So what is the reaction that you get from people when you launch into this whole explanation of how these things are very much moving targets and sites of evolving mm-hmm. meaning? Well, one of the things I do, so I give two walking tours for this little alternative walking tour company called Detours. Just (laughs) Google Detours Ottawa and it'll come up and it's great. And they do, there are monthly tours that are, uh, and then there are sort of by request tours. And one tour that I give, which involves a lot of the monuments on Parliament Hill, is uh, I, I talk about the sort of ambivalence of monuments, but also just at the moments of commemoration, sort of offer a little bit of discussion of what's not visible. So, right. if, for example, at the famous five monument on Parliament yes, Hill. Yes, yes. forget the exact uh, name of it. Uh, so they're really nice sort of writing about the person's case of 1929 and the fam- five women that pushed for women to be named persons so they could be appointed to the Senate. Um, but all the things that aren't present are the sort of uh, really problematic racism of of Emily Murphy and Nellie McClung and the eugenics policies they advocated, but also other things that aren't, so that's, that's concealed, but also what's concealed when you put up five women to stand in for first wave feminism, there were so many other women working at the same time who didn't share those racist politics. Like there are, there were other options. There were, uh, there were very clearly anti-racist first wave feminists and there were more socialist first wave feminists. Those are some other things that are, are sort of concealed 
when you put up a monument, people think, oh, okay, we've done, we've got that history. Right. So, so th- that's, those are some of the things I talk about on, on that tour is not just about the politics of monuments in general, but offer trying to offer some other alternative things that could be possible, some other things that could be commemorated. But if you take that example then of the famous five, say you're there and you're giving this context mm-hmm. to what happens, does anyone ever put up their hand and say, what are you talking about? These are five great women. They pushed for suffrage. They pushed for women's rights. Sh- like, does anyone, does anyone, is anyone sort of surprised that you are presenting this at this setting that, again, I think most people would associate that type of a monument. If you haven't seen it, do Google it. That sort of site as being celebratory. Yeah, people are, to be honest, I think that there is a, quite a clear um, selection bias of people who will sign up for a Detours Walking okay, Tour. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. it's not, it's already sort of um, framed as not your average walking tour. So people are very primed and, and ready to engage with alternative understand well, not alter- uh, with with critical takes on, right. on Canadian history and and monuments and so so not not really the the people that I've given um, tours to have generally been really uh, curious and engaged and have lots of questions and because yeah. Mm. yeah that social context I think is important too because I think of the War of 1812 monument that's on Parliament Hill as one that if it's still there in a hundred years how people will look at it because right mm-hmm. now and I realize I'm not necessarily the market for really any monument, but that statue right now just screams of big Harper. C conservative politics. Yeah. Right? It fit in with what their understanding of Canadian history was, the narrative that they wanted to present about what this country is. Good or bad, that's what it was. I mean, the, the big L liberal government is doing the same thing with other things mm-hmm. right now, presenting a narrative that they want. That's what governments do. But that statue or that monument is there in part large part because of that in a hundred years people might just look at it as a war statue without having the context of why it was constructed and that's mm-hmm. the thing that i think is so good that what you do is that you help provide that context but does it hurt the popular or the public understanding of history to have monuments that are put up in these types of contexts, because every monument is in some sort of social context, Mm -hmm. and there's a reason why it's there, and like you say, there's a reason why certain things aren't there, but for a public that may not be historians or sociologists, they might look at it, I think this is why you see what you see in the United States over the Confederate statues, people just say, this is our history. So they understand Mm -hmm. the sites, they look at maybe a public history program that says, hey, monuments, public history, without really understanding truly what public history is actually all about, and say, well, when you take it down, you're taking away the history. Mm-hmm. So like, how do we actually confront that dynamic? Because not everyone is going to go on a detour, mm-hmm. or not everyone is going to read this context of it. So where do we find a balance between educating everyone about the meaning of monuments, the sociological meaning of monuments, mm-hmm. without challenging this idea or without presenting it as overtaking away your history is that even possible well one thing that that i always uh say about about monuments is that um is that they are sort of embodied with this deep ambivalence so it's it's very hard for me to just have a blanket disdain for, well, I do for a few of some <laughs> monuments, yeah. uh, but there's always like, even if there's a monument you hate, it becomes, it can become a sort of like rallying site for asking bigger questions that go beyond monuments. Okay. So for me, it's like monuments are really, talking about monuments is really never just talking about monuments. If it was, I don't think I could keep talking about monuments right. yeah. for yeah. 15 years. Right. <laughs> but, but, uh, I mean, the, the War of 1812 Monument is not a good example to prove my point because I don't think people really do anything there or engage critically with it or, you know, no, use it a as great, a site of protest or yeah. anything. I mean, it's, it's also not, it, the location of it doesn't lend itself to it either in part. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I think, like, there are a few monuments that I, I, I don't know would advocate for just... Can I answer this question? I feel like part of your question is, like, can't we just, if we're going to do critical readings of monuments, some monuments should be torn down. 
Well, no, that's not what I, that's not what I'm advocating. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting is, I, I don't think it's possible for us to provide the context and the critical awareness of mm -hmm. why monuments are there and what they are doing mm -hmm. as they're there without getting pushback from people saying you're trying to take away the history. Because I don't look as look at monuments as pieces of history. I look at them as contemporary, Absolutely. almost yeah. more like architecture, yeah. which is constantly evolving and constantly changing and our understanding of it is. But I think a large portion of the population looks at it as history. Right. So I, I'm just wondering if there's some way to bridge the gap between people like you and me right, who approach right. them one way and I think the vast majority yeah. of the public who looks at them as pieces of history. You know what? This sort of reminds me of a lot of questions I had when I was beginning my research about methodology um, where people like during different stages like, well, how are you going to understand how people or if people care about monuments right. are you going to uh, do interviews at monuments are you going to survey people and ask them and so at one point i did do some interviews and it was like in kind of intercept interviews at different moments at monuments and and it it both felt kind of like um inappropriate at some points depending on what people were at the monument for but also uh useless at other points <laughs> because more no both are very important being appropriate is important but it was useless because for example you go to the war memorial um for remembrance day or for something and thousands of people are there and you ask them why are you here they gave you the stock answer right because we should because they fought for our freedom because all this sort of rhetoric we hear all the time and i don't th think that really sort of captures the potency of monuments. Mm. Yeah. So for me, it's not really the, a question of like, should the masses understand the sort of nuance, social and political weight of the monuments is less important right. than how were they meaningful in, in these certain moments and maybe smaller communities. And I think that's more... The sort of significant bit. Does that answer that question? I, th I think so. I, I think it does. So what what I want to do now, let's go and look at some monuments. All right. And we will come back and talk about what we see. So we're going to do some stuff from the monuments and we'll come back and do a little wrap up. So we are here at the Memorial for Aboriginal War Veterans that have died yes. here on Elgin Street across from the Lord. If you know Ottawa at all, we're right across from the Lord Elgin Hotel. Uh, right at Confederation Park here, right by City Hall. Mm -hmm. So this is somewhere that you go on your tours. Yes, absolutely. So this uh, monument, as you can see, it's called the National Aboriginal um, Veterans Memorial. And it was unveiled on National Aboriginal Day, which is National Indigenous Day now, in 2001. But it's history. So maybe first, Sean, you can describe for the viewers, <laughs> listeners, <laughs> yeah. what it looks like. So it is a, a rather large stone base uh -huh. and on on top of it you have uh, an indigenous gentleman or a soldier uh, surrounded by animals so there is a buffalo a bear a wolf and then a, a an eagle on top that is on like a staff of sorts yeah. uh, so it's the, the soldiers surrounded by, actually, excuse me, there's multiple soldiers, now that I look, uh -huh. on the other side. So multiple soldiers surrounded by these animals that are largely associated with the Canadian wilderness. Right, yeah. So this monument came an idea in a very specific moment in Ottawa. Uh, it was unveiled, as I said, in 2001. In 1996, there was a monumental controversy just over that north of here yeah. at the Champlain Monument because there there was for about 60 years uh, a barely clothed um, indigenous man crouched at the base of a monument to Champlain. So in the 1990s Chief uh, Ovid Mekrity came he saw that was appalled um, started protesting and it became a big question. Um, the NCC eventually took the scout down and the scout was moved to major hills park where you can still visit the scout and he was given he was named in an official naming ceremony just a few years ago 
Uh, but in that moment, after that controversy, one of the things that emerged was that Ottawa needs more positive representations of Indigenous people that come from and are designed by Indigenous people. So Indigenous veterans rallied around this idea of producing this monument. And it was designed by an Indigenous artist, Lloyd uh, Pinet, as you can see. And it was designed to represent really uh, Indigenous people from across the country who participated in all the wars Canada's participated in. And Indigenous men in particular enlisted at a disproportionately high rate. Oh. So if I think it was like in the, in the two world wars, one in 10 Canadians enlisted, but one in three Indigenous men enlisted. So they enlisted in a very high rate, but when they came home, they were not treated the same way non-Indigenous veterans were treated. In fact, some other veterans that were getting land in recognition of their service were getting land that was explicitly taken from Indigenous people. So Indigenous veterans enlisted at a, uh, people enlisted at a high rate and were not um, treated well on the return. So this is the context in which this monument was, was sort of born. Um, what I love about this monument is that Indigenous veterans love this monument, so I cannot offer any sort of aesthetic or any other critique of it. It's well used by Indigenous people and Indigenous veterans. You can see this every November 11th. There are wreaths, there's um, other offerings here. And I'd like us to go around to the back. Yeah. Follow, follow me. We head to the back here, uh, the park that now faces the park, yeah. as you look at it, where the uh, the buffalo and the uh, the moose, moose, no, that's a, uh, um, what is it? Where the who is the fit human figure described? Uh, so that appears to be a woman. It is. It is a woman, and it is the, as far as I can tell, the only representation of an indigenous woman in Ottawa. Wow. Yeah, and it is a, um, an unnamed indigenous female veteran. Excellent that there's this representation, but it also sort of highlights the dearth of representations right. of Indigenous women. Indigenous men, in contrast, if you go to Parliament Hill, you will see, or Old Banks of Montreal, you will see Indigenous men carved into the facade mm -hmm. alongside beavers and other sort right. of, of things, which very sort of fraught, problematic representations, but still there. Whereas Indigenous women have been sort of very much made invisible in this right. capital space. So I said one thing I love about it is the people that designed it and for, for people that it's for, love it. Uh, one other sort of thing I'd, I'd like to highlight is that we have in Ottawa some other named uh, commemorations of Indigenous people. We have, well, one in particular is at the Valiance Memorial, there's a monument to the uh, Mohawk leader, Joseph Brandt. And what both Joseph Brandt and this statue do is they offer a positive representation of indigeneity in the capital, but they're also both representations that line, align perfectly with the sort of logic and the values of the Canadian nation state. Right. So what we don't have in Ottawa are any sort of commemorations to, uh, to uh, Louis Riel, Poundmaker, Indigenous leaders and fighters that were working for Indigenous people. Right. So, for example, just over at City Hall, there's a, should we wait for that? Yeah, as the uh, police paramedic. The paramedic go by. Um, just over there, by City Hall, in front of the drill hall, there's a old 1888 monument to two white settler soldiers who fought in the Battle of Cutknife Hill, fighting against Poundmaker. Mm -hmm. And those, the, the Northwest Rebellions of 1885, were about clearing the land of Indigenous people to make the railroad for this Canadian nation state building process. So it's like, it's excellent to have Indigenous War Veterans Memorial, but it also, we should think about what other Indigenous leaders we don't commemorate this national right. capital. Right, so part of that what's missing thing that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. So with that, we're going to cross the street. We're going to go to the... Canadian so, Tribute. 
Canadian tribute to human rights. So that's where we're off to next. So we are now here at the Human Rights Monument. That's what I always call it. Yeah. I, I think there's a better name for it. There's the te- there's the technical name for it, or the specific name. The Canadian tribute to human rights. Is right. What it's called. So the Human Rights Monument. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go with that. So. This one is very, very different. This was one you can walk on and walk uh-huh. in and walk through. <laughs> there are words uh, here. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights in both official languages. Yep. Uh, so what do we know about this one? This, mo- well, one thing, if you're new to Ottawa or not, you will become acquainted with it very quickly because, or if you pay any attention to any sort of social justice thing, a lot of stuff happens at this monument. This is one of the most actively used monuments in Ottawa all seasons whenever there's a human rights violation uh, people gather here or they gather here for vigils to mourn Um, the women's march right after Trump was inaugurated took started here and uh, did a loop around a bunch of other marches go through here or go from the human rights monument to Parliament Hill Mm -hmm. the human rights monument to the police station down the street or another very popular route the Human Rights Monument to the Women's Monument in Minto Park, which is a violence against women monument. Few people, fewer people know about, but you you should. Yeah, and it's about four blocks south down Elgin Street, give or take. Yeah. Uh, Less than a kilometer, certainly. Yeah, so it's a very well-used monument. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of of the monument. It's from this bus, please. So, the 1980s, there was a group in Ottawa of... um, Polish people in Ottawa and they were wanting to do something to show solidarity with the Solidarność movement going on in Poland. So they appealed to City Hall, they said, we have an idea, could you please change the name of Daily Ave to Solidarność Ave in solidarity. Any guesses, Sean, why Daily Ave? Uh, Daily Ave. In Sandy Um, Hill. Yes, it is in Sandy Hill, which is where the University of Ottawa is. Mm -hmm. I've walked down that street many a time. Mm-hmm. Is there a former mayor? Polish Embassy. Polish Embassy. Polish Embassy. Polish Embassy. There you go. So the city said... Oh, sorry. Said, why they wanted to change... Yeah. I thought you were asking mm-hmm. why it was daily. At- no. Oh, okay. No. Yeah, okay. sorry. Yeah, lots yeah, so of the former Pol- mayors, Yes, so. the Polish Embassy is... Yeah, the Polish Am- Embassy is on daily app, so that's why they picked it. And the city is like, no, we're not going to insult the, the tenants of the street. So clearly, so no. So the group decided... Well... How about, let's wait for those motorcycles. Yeah. Instead of that, um, we pool our resources to build a monument to human rights in general. That idea took off like gangbusters. Everybody was behind it. They quickly fundraised. All political parties supported it. All sorts of, of faith groups supported it. Unions, support, individuals, authors everybody gave money because it's an easy thing to sort of vaguely broadly embrace right yeah it's hard to be against human rights (laughs) yeah right it really is (laughs) and they're like well it's about it's the first canadian international canadian monument to international human rights and and etc uh so everybody loved it and now and one thing people think that this monument's like government art or something it is not it is a grassroots citizens thing so now I'll tell you a bit about the monument itself. Let's do it because it's it, the shape of it, the design of it is Seems unique. And yes. Yeah, it's made out of um, concrete and granite, sort of austere yeah. material. It doesn't have the warmth of a figurative statue so much. Well, this is the design of a Montreal-based designer, Melvin Charney, and what he was doing with it was speaking to the National War Memorial down the street. Okay. So down the street, you have an arch with 22 bronze soldiers and horses charging through. Yeah. Here, you have a granite arch with the first line of the UN Declaration of Human Rights on it. Yeah. And sort of concrete anthropomorphized beams. Mm. And the idea is the very sort of straightforward logic is down there, soldiers, they fought for freedom, birth of the nation. Here... It's the people who can walk through the monument, people that are alive today, that uphold Mm. the values of human rights. Isn't that nice? That is really nice. So they work in concert, really. They totally work. And on the top of the beams, we have equality, dignity, and rights. So those are the Mm. big ideas. But 
early on in the, the life of the monument, the committee realized that, oh, one sidebar before I go to that. The first draft of this monument didn't have the first line of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. It had a line from a speech by the Solidarność leader, Lech Wałęsa, and it was something about following a path to dignity and something like okay. that. So there's this path idea. Um, that line was swapped out for this line at the suggestion of John Humphreys, who incidentally wrote <laughs> the okay. first line. And there's a plaque to John Humphreys along here. Okay. There are lots of plaques. You can hear there are them. a lot of plaques. This monument here, yeah. is well interpreted. For yes. Them. But now let's go inside the monument. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So if you've never been to Ottawa, there's some steps up here that are parallel to Elegant Street that we are walking up now. Uh, and sort of a ramp that goes down after you go through the arch as we walk through the arch through right the arch. now and we can see and stop. here we're in the monument so early in the monument's history they realized that having the idea equality dignity and rights in english and french was not uh sufficient so it took them a few decades but the committee and fundraising and a lot of work with linguists they translated those three concepts mm -hmm. into over 70 indigenous languages. Wow. And so all these plaques have indigenous translations for dignity, equality, and rights. Wow. And they're also positioned in sort of geographical order. Oh, as to where, so, these, where these nations are? Yeah, so the northern languages, here we have a nectar here, oh, the, yeah, yeah. and the east eastern languages over here oh interesting so it works and it works geographically with the city too like sort of east like yeah. east is that like it's not yes. just sort of on the monument yes saying up right left like yeah. it's sort of actually that direction on the city and then there's a land uh statement as well uh acknowledging that this is the traditional territory of the algonquin and anishinaabe people yes and this so this you can see it was installed at the same time as these language plaques. And it is great because, as I said earlier, um, we have commemorations of indigenous soldiers. We also have sort of uh, imported totem poles that have very sort of fraught and interesting histories in Ottawa. But there are fewer commemorations and recognition of the uh, local indigenous people that Ottawa uh, right. is on unceded land. Right. So we have this here and there's a new also monument right outside City Hall, so that's a good one right. to check. And there's actually three languages, the land statement, English, French, and I'm assuming that's Algonquin mm -hmm. uh, yes. as well. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. And and with these things, you can sort of see again how it's a living yes. uh, monument, certainly. Yeah. And, and you can see each of the, the translations is numbered as well. Oh yeah, there's um, a map down here. So you can actually figure out yeah. which is which. If you don't speak that language, you yeah. can figure out which language wish is now we head down the ramp towards the uh, end of it. And there is a map right at the foot of the monument that explains all the different languages and where they are located on the map. So how uh -huh. cool, that's pretty cool. Yes. So this monument is really sort of embodies this idea that monuments are not reflections of the past, but they're really about doing, reflecting something and producing an idea about a present society. So right. what do we want to be? And as you said, there's, they're very act, it's very actively used. So it's a constantly evolving, constantly being used by my, the public. My one critique of this monument is this addition here. So there's, it, it, it's in the shape of almost like a, like a parking thing. You know, when you go into a, a, a parking lot, yeah. there's those like concrete things at the end of the space. It's sort of in that shape and it has all the major donors to the monument yeah. since 1993. Yeah, I just don't like that. It kind of, <laughs> yeah, it kind of takes away from it a little the monument bit. shouldn't be to the funders of, of the monument. Right. It I don't have anything more critical to say except I don't like it. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. All right, so now we're going to head back to the studio. Yes. And uh, we'll sort of wrap up and, and break down what we just saw. Great. All right, we are back from Monuments. Very exciting. Thank you, Tanya. That was fun. Great. So now that we're here, uh, I want to give you my extremist position. And I want to just know what you think as a sociologist right. who studies these things. Mm -hmm. Now, because I get the sense that when we put up a statue or when we name something after someone, because this is these two things are, are I think, related. Absolutely. 
that creates a very celebratory thing. That we're, it's like we're celebrating that individual. So my position mm -hmm. is don't name anything after anyone uh -huh. and don't put up any statues to individuals because in doing so, you almost deify them yeah. and it doesn't allow for a critical examination of who they are. So when the president of the United States, for instance, says, oh, if they want to take down this one, what's next? George Washington? My answer is, yeah, sure. George Washington. <laughs> take that one down too. And if you want to put up monuments to commemorate events, to commemorate moments, I'm good with that because I think that is more subtle. It allows for context. Mm -hmm. But don't put it up to a person where you don't allow for context. You're deifying the person. You don't allow space to critically understand them because at our core, human beings are flawed. Every human being that's ever existed is flawed. And to put up a statue, I think, takes away from that. It takes away from the humanity of that individual. So I say don't name stuff after people. Don't put up statues to individuals. Commemorate acts. Commemorate moments. But not people. Social movements, maybe? Yeah. Like, so if you take, say, the Famous Five, for instance, yeah. don't have it be about the people. Sure. Have it be yeah. about what they accomplished people. for women's yeah. rights. Mm -hmm. And that makes it more to me more reflective of what they did one and two it doesn't deify them and it allows space for the critical examination of the things that you talked about in the first part of our, our conversation so that would be my position on it hmm. but i realize that for a lot of my built heritage friends that may be somewhat extremist and i know for members of the public who i've talked to or friends of mine who are not historians they find that rather extremist as well so as someone who studies these things, I would like to know what you think about what I've been told is somewhat extremist <laughs> position. Okay. I'm going to answer by way of another story. Love it. <laughs> but it is supporting your radical uh, position. Okay. So one of the things about, you may be familiar with this monument that's quite close to here, the National War Memorial. Yeah. Which we just the, saw, yeah, actually. Yeah. We were, uh, we were right there. Well, the thing, part of the, the great sort of power of the National War Memorial is that it is all about the citizen soldier, right? Yeah. It is, it is exactly what you are describing. It's about a moment in history, and it, it is representing 60,000 Canadians who lost their lives. And it is so powerful. There was a, a vigil in 2008 where they light projected names on the monument as this oh. virtual. And people would come and they saw their great uncles and it was very moving. Right. But also the night lighting, like when the big shadow, very powerful. Right. That, for me, sort of really captures the potential of monuments in a way that is radically different in the very close more contemporary Valiance Memorial, mm -hmm. which is a monument of the 14 soldiers, yes. named soldiers, some of whom, like Arthur Curry, also have sort of fraught histories, right? Yeah. He was, he sued a newspaper for libel because <laughs> right. they were criticizing him after, after the war. So I think that you can point to that when you're having your conversations with your, your friends and family and say, well, what do you find more meaningful, the war memorial? With a Valiance Memorial. Right. And, and to put it in sort of that military context, too, having worked with the Vimy Foundation, having been in, in Belgium and France, I was struck by certainly Meningate and Vimy are like that, that there are individual names on them, mm -hmm. but they're more representative of the whole mm -hmm. than anything else. The Ring of Remembrance is another one that's sort of the, the, the totality of it. And there weren't many places that we went to that were named after people. Mm -hmm. It was sort of representative of the whole thing, or a lot of were just pure location based. And that, I liked that. It, it spoke to the moment in time as opposed to necessarily the person. And there are ways to honor people or the act of. I think the Victoria Cross is a perfect example of this, mm -hmm. if we're going to stay with military stuff, that it doesn't honor the person and everything they did, it honors that heroic, valorous act. Mm -hmm. And that I really like because. It, uh, it, just, uh, it, it just allows for context. It allows for a critical, full understanding of, of a person. And that's what I think we need to do more of. And not just maybe even in history, just in general, is get away from hero worship. The or, cult of the individual. Yeah, the yeah, cult of personality, sure. which certainly is a big part of North American life. and always has always been. Right? Celebrities have been a big part of North America for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So 
maybe it's just part of that, but if we can get away from it in our memorialization and our public history, in terms of built public history, mm-hmm. I think we could be better off. I don't. I don't think that's that radical of a position. We and we have other sort of examples in Ottawa. The Corktown Cross and the Corktown Bridge yeah. are both commemorating the the canal builders from yep. the county of Cork. Um, there's a street in uh, Gatineau, which I'm going to pronounce incorrectly. Sorry, listeners. <laughs> Les Allumiateurs. I think that's okay. Named and that is named for the matchstick girls. So mm. women who made matches, and they many of them died of this awful, fossy, fossy jaw. Oh, thing, because of all the chemicals. Yeah. Uh, but that is like a workers. So both of those are workers' heritage right. commemorations that are also commemorating people in time and place that were sort of foundational for building where we are. Yeah, now. yeah, so, there are many. Yeah, so I mean that's sort of my takeaway from it. But we would encourage everyone to go on a detour if you're in yes. Ottawa. And there are I do detours on Ottawa, but um, there are also other great detours on the Central Experimental Farm, on uh, different architecture tours. There's a great sort of lineup. Yeah, so check them out online. We will link to it in the uh, write up at ActiveHistory.ca, and we'll show some, we'll have some photos too of where we just were. If if you've never been here, we'll put up some photos, and you can also Google image all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but get out there and see the monuments if you're in Ottawa or even where you are. There's monuments, there's public history stuff everywhere across the country. Absolutely. Certainly, there's going to be some sort of cenotaph or, or war memorial in pretty much every community across the country. So go out, check them out, do some research, figure out why they're there. And uh, let us know what you think. So, Tanya Davidson, thank, thank you, you very much. If you have any questions or comments for the podcast, history slam at gmail.com. Twitter is at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.